Thanks very much uh, to both ISSP and RCIS for inviting me to talk. So there's no doubt machine learning is changing the way that we work and do science. And the way I like to think of it is essentially machine learning is all about software writing software. So who in the audience is a developer? Who writes software? Okay, a few people. So what this is all about is taking the source code that we write and transforming this to a process where we frame a problem in machine learning terms and then we go out and collect data and use this to train a system. And the process by which we compile software source code into an executable to run on our computer, this has now been transformed to a learning process or a learning algorithm that consumes this data and produces not an executable but a predictor, a predictive system. And the object of this predictive system is to then consume inputs that it's never seen before and perform well on them. So this has two huge implications. The first is that when we let machines write the software instead of humans, they're capable of producing programs that are much more systematic and much more accurate than the programs that humans can write alone. And secondly, we can actually write software for problems that are really out of the reach of human developers. And the one I like to give an example of frequently is the software to, to drive a car. So I'd like you to think about all that's been achieved with software over the last 30 years, and then pause and think about essentially transcending the limitations of human creativity and human linear thinking, and actually morphing this idea of writing programs into a search over a high dimensional space of all the possible programs that there could be out there, and then unleash an algorithm to do this search. So this is why economists are effectively calling AI a general purpose technology. So this search is going to be supported by exponentially growing computation. And it's also going to be able to plug directly into a catalog of basically all the human knowledge that's out there. So this is very, very effective program writing. So the reality here is that we've all heard about companies and governments racing to invest in infrastructure and also talent. But most of the recent successes have really been in a few domains, vision, speech and audio processing, and natural language. And this has largely been due to the form of machine learning, or AI, being focused on a particular technology, which is supervised deep learning, which uses extremely large labeled data sets. But to scale machine learning up to problems that are really challenging and ones con that concern us as a society, we need more than just supervised deep learning. So today's machine learning systems are largely predictive. That means that they produce reasonably simple outputs, like a time to get from point A to, a to B, or a price, you know, you're say forecasting a stock, or maybe a temperature, and so forth. But actually, this, the emerging systems are becoming not just predictive, but creative. So they're able to generate highly complex forms of text, maybe digital assets for video games or virtual worlds, uh, even onto physical objects. And some of you might be already familiar with Google's auto reply feature or the Smart Compose, which was just released a few weeks ago, uh, that's been integrated into Gmail. So auto reply is something, it's, it's AI system that basically reads your email and then proposes uh, three possible responses that are generally quite short. And this is an amazing system. It can save you a lot of time during the day. It can write your emails for you. But really, the reality is I use it for maybe about 5% of my emails. I haven't handed all my email over to this AI system. That would be completely crazy. But it's in this kind of human-in-the-loop um, framework that I think is where we're going to coexist with machines for quite a long time. So it proposes some responses for me, and I can select one of them, or I can choose just not to act on them at all. So what are these implications of creative systems? Well, for one, the type of data that's being created by these creative systems is getting to the point where sometimes it's indistinguishable from the works that humans can create themselves. It's incredibly realistic. And we're already starting to see the proliferation of fake news and other types of media that's been generated by algorithms. And the generation of not just digital assets, but physical asset assets also move us to the point around some very interesting IP and copyright issues. 
So I'd like to take us now from talking about what these machine learning systems are capable over to how they actually learn. And presently there's a huge gap in terms of the way that machines learn and the way that humans learn. So as an example, I'd like you to consider machine translation systems. So these can actually take an English sentence and convert it to a French sentence very effectively. But these types of systems have typically been trained on the order of hundreds of millions of paired examples. So an example of an English sentence, an example of a French sentence, say three or four hundred million of these examples. But humans, they don't learn from hundreds of millions of examples. They learn from just a few examples. In some cases, they learn from just a single example. Humans are also generalists. So these systems that have been based on machine learning are actually able to sometimes exceed human capabilities on a single task, like translation. But humans don't just do translation, they do all sorts of other things and they transfer knowledge among these different tasks that they're able to perform. So I mentioned before that a lot of the existing systems leverage what's called supervised learning and rely on these huge labeled data sets. And this has really limited us to cloud-based applications, the vision, the speech, the natural language processing, and so forth I mentioned before. But really there's some types of learning that are actually able to transcend this and move out to physical systems. So one of them is something called reinforcement learning. And the implications of applications of machine learning in the physical world are really exciting. So I'd like to maybe remind you, maybe some of you have seen this in, in the news, something called AlphaGo that was produced by Google DeepMind. This is a Go playing system. The news was out about this towards the end of last year. And AlphaGo was a system that learned to be the best Go playing system on the planet, beating any machine system or any human in playing Go by playing itself about two and a half million times over the course of three days. And so this is a really, really capable system that's learned to do, again, a single task really, really well. And it's fascinating. So this thing, I guess, just goes out, plays itself over and over and over again, and learns to master a very complicated game. And what's really novel about this particular system and, and sort of exceeds the, the previous generation is that it's no expert play involved. So the previous games learn from seeing experts play the game of Go, but this system was entirely self-play. The experts actually went back and looked at this system and, and saw what it learned. It actually learned strategies that humans mastered over about a thousand years of playing Go. And it mastered these strategies in about three days. But that wasn't, that wasn't it. It actually went beyond that and started to produce strategies that were very creative and counterintuitive, much different than the strategies that were generated by humans. So while this is really exciting for learning systems, the reality is that it can actually do this because it can play a game in a fraction of a second. That's why it could play you know, two and a half million games in three days. But the really big problems that we want to solve, for example, those in agriculture or those in healthcare, you can't get an outcome in a fraction of a second. It takes a growing season, or maybe it takes several courses, or several months over a course of treatment. So the time scales are very, very different. And on a personal note, I actually struggle with motivating some of my graduate students to take on these really big problems like in ag or healthcare because of how fast the field is moving. So they're motivated to be able to, you know, instead of collecting data over the course of a year, just be able to download a data set or get a simulation or, or get a, a, a game playing environment and work on problems where they can develop an algorithm and test it and show that it outperforms the state of the art or beats the other competitors in a competition in maybe four to six months. So in conclusion, how fast does this field actually move? Well, I can, I can tell you with all honesty that Whenever my Android phone these days pushes an update, I actually notice a difference in the quality of the machine learning on the device. So this is in the form of, say, the predictive text systems that underlie the, the Smart Compose or the AutoCorrect when, when we're writing text or emails, or the speech recognition that's on the phone that I'm using fairly regularly. And it's pretty exciting, it's inspiring, and I feel really good to be working in this field. And I feel even better to be working here in Canada, supported by government, and universities and industry. So thanks again for your attention and look forward to your questions and talking more.